Hello, everybody, and welcome. Jeez, the crowd just keeps getting bigger this summer. This is fantastic. <laughs> um, great, so this is our second to last uh, lunch and learn for the summer. Um, we will be starting one up again in the fall, hopefully again. Uh, I gotta look into some ideas and, and things to talk about, but we'll be starting up again in the fall of some point, probably late September. Um, but today we're in. Uh, on August 1st, we're going to be talking about tissue tiring. So this week is part one, and then a couple weeks we'll have part two. Um, so today, what I want to do for the first half is just give you a little introduction to the basics of tissue clearing, what's actually going on there, an introduction to some of the different methods and some of the ones that have been more popular um, in the facility. And then uh, Ted from the Lieber Lab, he's going to give you a quick overview of immunostating. Um, immunostating definitely seems to be like one of the most difficult parts of um, tissue clearing. If you can avoid it with genetic reporters, that's definitely good um, word. But if you do have to do it, Ted's done some incredible um, optimization of, of his samples, which won't necessarily translate to your samples, because we're finding that every antibody and every piece of tissue is very different. Um, but it's going to give you some good ideas of some of the things to watch out for. Um, and then for part two next time, uh, I'm going to go into a little more uh, detail about how we actually image these tissues, so which microscopes will be used, which are the best techniques for doing that. And we'll also talk a bit about what we can do with all the data, because obviously when you're imaging something big, you get a big file in the end. All right, so that's the plan for the, for the next two weeks. Okay. Um, so this is what we're hopefully going to get to in the end. So um, microscopes, this is your sort of stereotypical high school microscope. Uh, hopefully you have some nicer slides than these. But what I want to point out here is that when microscopy was developed, um, this is the sample that was always in mind, or what a microscope developer was thinking about. It was something very small, something very thin. Um, so microscopes originally discovered things like bacteria um, and protists and all these things that were too small for our eyes to see, but themselves were very tiny and very thin, and easily you could transmit light through those to illuminate them to get it back to the eyepiece of the camera or your eye. And so microscopes were always developed with this in mind, but they're going to be looking at these really small samples. So. The objectives here, there's not a lot of space in between the objective and where the sample sits. And you're often relying on light that like, can just pass through the sample and then get to the objective to go up to the eyepiece for that illumination. And so it wasn't until I mean, basically the 90s um, when confocal became commercialized and became more popular, but um, when looking at biological samples under a microscope, we actually started looking thicker than just these really thin, tiny sections. And we started to have the ability to do optical sectioning and start to build up 3D images once we had some fluorescent staining of that tissue. But again, that still ran into problems. And this is the big problem. So these are two little plastic cubes side by side. They both filled with water. Uh, obviously, this is this exact same laser pointer shooting through them. And you can see that when this laser goes through the first one here, the light is just passing directly through that cube. There's nothing but scattering or reflecting out of that water and coming back towards the camera, which is obviously right here. Okay. Now, the difference between this cube and this one over here is this one contains, uh, I think it was 10 microliters of coffee cream. Okay. So if you look at these two cubes, you hold them side by side, they look absolutely identical to your eye. But you can see that this laser can no longer pass through this one directly. It's hitting something inside here, it's the components of that coffee cream, that are causing that laser light to bounce out in all directions, okay? And some of it is bouncing back towards the camera. So obviously biological tissue isn't just pure water. It contains a lot of the things that are in the coffee cream, proteins, lipids. Um, and so this is what happens when we start shining a laser into our sample under a microscope. Instead of that laser passing nicely through the whole tissue and illuminating everything, um, we start to have this 
what we've always called light scatter, the scattering of that, that light. And same thing with your fluorescence is coming back there. So this creates a limit on how deep we can image into something. So the first thing I want to spend a little bit of time on is just talking about light scatter itself. Um, in my opinion, it's a bit of a misnomer. In my opinion, it doesn't really describe what's going on. But so these are um, a couple of beautiful pictures of the West Coast, what we often look at see here in New England. Um, but these are two great examples of light scatter. And this is probably stuff like you learned about in high school. Why is the sky blue? Why does the sun suck look red? So if we look at this picture here first and we talk about why is the sky blue, if we look directly at the sun, I'm just trying to do that here. Um, that light that's coming down here looks like white light. So that's what's coming from the sun. But obviously, those rays of light that are coming from the sun are going in all directions. They're not all coming directly at you. There are some that are passing out um, into the atmosphere, into the sky at a different angle away from you. And what happens is, in a certain layer of the atmosphere, um, there's some thermal currents there, as well as some small atoms and molecules that can interact with that light and cause that light to bend into different directions. So you can think of that, um, if you see some blue light here, there's white light coming from the sun, it's scattering off of something here, and then coming towards this camera, okay? So why is the blue light coming and not the red or the green? Um, it has to do with the actual substances that are causing the scattering event. So the thermal currents and the molecules out in the atmosphere, they're much smaller than the wavelength of light. If you have something that's scattering that's smaller than the wavelength of light, you have a wavelength dependent scatter. So what's happening is the blue light is being scattered, but the green and the red is still continuing on. Okay. And so this is sort of the same idea, is that at night, when the sun gets low on the horizon, and you can actually look more directly at it, um, what you're seeing now is all the light that's passing through a lot more of the atmosphere to get to you, so there's a lot more being scattered, all that blue light is being scattered away before it gets to you, and you're just seeing most of the green too, and you're just seeing the oranges and the reds. Um, so this is kind of the traditional high school definition of light scattering. Uh, in physics, it's often referred to as Rayleigh scattering. And the key here is that this is wavelength dependent, so you're going to scatter blue light more than you're going to scatter red light. And it's due to scattering molecules that are much smaller than the wavelength of light. Okay. So these are my New England pictures. Uh, this is a nice little apple orchard as well. This is the water that comes out of our apple. Um, and so this is a different type of scatter. So one of the first things you might notice is that we don't have this color separation anymore. We just see white scattered. So all wavelengths of light are being scattered. Um, but what's going on here is in this situation, we've got fog. So fog is basically water fog water particles in the air, very small water particles in the air. And over here, this cloudiness that's disappearing over time is air bubbles in water. Okay? So it doesn't matter whether you put water in air or air in water, you get the same scattering effect. So what's that saying is that it's not an inherent property of one of those objects. It has something to do with the relationship between them. Okay? And so these particles here, the water molecules and the air bubbles, they're actually larger than the wavelength of light. This is referred to as me scattering. It's not wavelength dependent for scattering all of those wavelengths all at the same time. And those scattering molecules are all much larger than the wavelength of light. A much larger, much larger. So that's the, the sort of two different scattering events. So if we take a look at some biological tissue, so here's a couple pieces of brain tissue. And you can see they kind of look white. So what do you think is the <coughs> scattering process that's happening in there? Me scattering. Truth is, both of them are happening. But the one that we're seeing, and that's going to be the most predominant, um, let's say, inhibition for our ability to image that tissue, is the me scattering. Okay? And so this is an example of a paper out of Eric Betzig's lab. Um, and this is imaging into zebrafish brain tissue, which is actually one of the clearest and easiest types of biological tissue to image into. 
Uh, but you can see that this is just going down 200 microns, and as you start going down, the image is getting blurrier and blurrier and harder to see. Um, a lot of the time, some tissues, you can't even get much past 80, and you don't see anything at all. Okay? This is with a traditional one photon excitation process. So in general, like 200 microns is kind of thought of as, as a, a barrier to, to one photon confocal imaging. You usually can't go much deeper than that. Okay. With two photon excitation, we can now use infrared light. So the further we go into the red, the less scattering we have. And we can get a little bit deeper in there. But we're still limited to um, about a millimeter at best, usually. So these are the barriers that had existed to us in the past. Um, in this paper here, uh, that's a glove actually used some fancy adaptive optics to get a little deeper. Um, and that will help you out a little bit, but it still won't get to the levels of what we're looking at when we're talking about tissue clearing when we really want to go millimeters into a piece of tissue. Okay. So what's <coughs> happening in between these two different cubes? So in this cube on the left, it just has the pure water. Let's look at that um, first. So what's happening here is our light, our laser light's coming into the cube and it's contacting some water molecules that are right at the edge there. So that's what these stars here represent. And when that light hits these stars here, because you're in that liquid, those water molecules are all packed pretty nice and tight together. And what happens is there's always a molecule at least half a wavelength away. And so what that means is when this light comes in and hits these simultaneously and the light scatters, any light from the blue light that scatters, or from the blue star that scatters up towards the yellow um, is going to interfere with the light scattering from that yellow one. It's going to be a destructive interference and that light is no longer going to be able to travel in that pathway. Okay? So that's what's being shown here, is that all these stars, as they scatter light going straight up, that light interferes with each other, and we get this destructive interference, okay? And this actually holds true for any direction except the forward direction. So in the forward direction, there's something a little different that's happening here. So what's happening here is this incident light comes in, and it scatters up this red star. So it's this red star, and then this is the scattered light here. In the scattering process, there's actually a really brief absorption of that light into the electron cloud of this molecule here, and then it delays that light going forward. Okay? And so if we look, the delayed light from the red one will now align perfectly with the delayed light when the sensitive light hits the blue one and scatters, okay? So you can see, instead of getting this destructive interference pattern here, when we start overlaying all these scattering events on top of each other, you can see they're all adding up destructively. So obviously we can't destroy energy, so all of this interference is deconstructed in all directions except the forward direction is gonna be constructive direction. So that's why this laser beam that's coming in here just passes straight through and we never see any light coming in towards the camera. Okay? It's not saying that there's no scattering happening here. There's all kinds of scattering happening here. In fact, all the light coming from this laser, as soon as it penetrates a very short distance into that water, it's all been scattered. Okay? But it just has to do with the ways that scattered light interferes constructively or deconstructively. Now the difference over here is we now have those water molecules, but we also have this lipid and protein that's in there. And that lipid and protein doesn't have the same um, ability to scatter light as the water. So some of those molecules will be better at scattering, some of them will be worse at scattering. And what that means is we no longer have all of these nice homogeneous similar molecules packed in nice and tight. Um, so that when you scatter off of one, it interferes with one beside it, uh, because we have all this lipid and protein in between. So what this does is it breaks down all of that um, deconstructive interference uh, on the lateral aspects or the reverse aspects of, of the angle of this light. That all breaks down, and now we just have light going in that direction. <coughs> okay. 
So that's what's going on in the, in the second queue. So how do we figure out um, how homogeneous or heterogeneous a mixture is? Because obviously I can pour water and ethanol, let's say, together into one of these cubes, and it's going to look just like this. It's not going to look like that. Okay? And the reason for that is water and ethanol have a very similar refraction index. So what that means is they have a very similar ability to scatter light, to absorb those photons that are coming in for that brief period and then re-emit them in another direction. So as long as substances have very similar refractive indices and are doing a similar amount of scatter, you're going to get uh, a homogeneous solution, or it's going to look homogeneous to the light that's going through it. It's when things are heterogeneous that you get all the scatter and that sort of white body look that we see in biological tissue. Yeah. So why do we have all these refractive index mismatches in tissue? It's just because of the composition of it. So we have some intracellular and extracellular fluid that's essentially water with some salts and maybe some proteins in it. Um, this has a refractive index very close to water. It's just a little bit higher than water. We also have a lot of lipids <coughs> from the mitochondria and the Golgi. Uh, these are our really big problem in biological tissue, and they have a refractive index And then we also have a whole bunch of proteins, um, and these can have very high refractive indices. Okay? So you can see there's a whole bunch of mismatches here, and that's why our biological tissue is just scattered like that. So the whole idea behind tissue clearing is trying to do your best to match all of these refractive indices all the way through the tissue so that you get a nice, clear, crystal clear sample that looks just like water. So there's all kinds of these techniques um, out there now. So this is a review that Jeff Lickman and I wrote in 2015. Uh, this is an update that we did in 2017, and even since then there have been more. Um, so trying to keep on top of this for the last few years has been pretty difficult. But you can break these down into a number of categories. Uh, so there's a bunch of techniques but our, we refer to it as the solvent-based techniques. So as the name says, these use solvents. Um, the drawback to that is if you have any fluorescent proteins in there, in general, those are going to be quenched, and you're going to have to immunostain afterwards. Uh, also, the solvents, some of them can be pretty damaging to microscopes, so we have to be pretty careful how we use those in the facility. Um, the aqueous-based techniques, we can break those down into simple immersion techniques. These are ones where you just dump your tissue in it and wait from the exchange of solution a few times. Um, the hyperhydration techniques, these actually try to um, take hydrophobic regions of your sample and penetrate some water in there a little bit better to reduce the overall refractive index. Um, and then we have a bunch of hydrogel embedding <coughs> techniques. So this is like clarity, where you embed your sample in the hydrogel first and then remove some components of that. I'm going to go into more detail these. Um, and then uh, a newer category that wasn't around in our first review is, is hydrogel embedding and hyperhydration techniques. So it's basically combining these two categories at the same time. You put something in hydrogel and then you blow it up really big. So this is expansion microscopy. But although we have all these different techniques and all these different categories, they all go through the same four very similar steps. So sometimes there's a pretreatment. Then you do a permeabilization of that tissue, try to remove some of the lipid. You can do your amino labeling, and then um, you're going to do your final clearing or refractive index matching. Okay? And this is pretty much the cycle you go through, although, as Ted's going to tell you, this amino labeling can happen at, at different points. Okay. Um, so, what am I talking about each of these steps? So, your pre treatment, this is sometimes some decolorization and bleaching, so maybe a hydrogen peroxide stuff just to get rid of some of the um, inherent um, polarization that might be in that tissue. Uh, you might do some autofluorescence quenching, and then in the hydrogel embedding techniques, you're protecting that tissue in the hydrogel. There's a bunch of different ways to remove lipid. We can do our amino staining. We're usually just doing it through simple diffusion. There's been a couple other techniques that have been proposed, but they haven't really caught on. And then what we do is we take that tissue and dump it in a final solution that's going to try and match the refractive index of everything that's left behind. 
right. So just to show you what this looks like for the different categories, um, for solvent-based clearing, uh, this is a list of some of the different techniques that fall into this category. Essentially what you're doing is you just take your sample and the first thing you want to do is dehydrate it. So you have to get all of the water out of there because um, that water is not going to be compatible with the solvents that you use to, to clear the, the tissue in the end. This is usually done with methanol, so we go through a methanol series to dehydrate that tissue. That's going to remove all of the water. It's going to remove a little bit of lipid as well. And then we're going to put on a final um, clearing solvent. And what that's going to do is that's going to remove some more liquid, uh, and it's going to match the refractive index of what's left behind. So we've removed all that intracellular and extracellular fluid. We've removed all the lipid with these harsh solvents. And all we're left with in the end is some protein. And we've matched the refractive index of that with the solvent that we put on. Okay. This is definitely kind of like the one of the easiest ways to do it and most consistently, one of the techniques that could do the most consistently clear tissue in the end. But like I said before, it does have a couple of drawbacks to it. So simple immersion is probably the easiest. This is, you just take your tissue, you dump a clearing agent on it, and you just wait. Um, you might refresh that agent every couple days, every couple months. I've had people that have done um, some of the original uh, treatments like CBD and stuff like that they're doing for over a year. Um, but essentially what you're doing here is you're just replacing the intracellular and extracellular fluid with a higher refractive index solution. So you still have these mismatches with your lipids and your proteins, they're still there behind. Um, but you're just trying to get that overall refractive index a little bit higher so that there's less of a mismatch there uh, and get most of that water out. Um, hyperhydration is very similar. You put a clearing reagent on and you cycle it over time. But what's happening here is you've introduced usually some detergent that's going to uh, get rid of some of the lipid that's in your sample. And you're also using um, uh, chemicals like urea or formamide, which are basically able to penetrate into hydrophobic regions of protein and then pull water in along with them kind of opens up that hydrophobic region and reduces its overall refractive index. So these ones are, you're using a solution that's higher than the refractive index of water, but you're also trying to reduce the refractive index of some of the components that are, are still in the sample there. So it's kind of coming at it from both angles. Um, so again, you're replacing that intracellular and extracellular fluid, you're removing the lipid, and then we're, what we call hyperhydrating the protein so that you reduce it. Um, so with the hydrogel embedding techniques, what you're doing here is you're, you're taking your sample. This can either be done as during perfusion with a whole animal, or you can do this just after you have a, a tissue excised. But you're basically embedding that tissue in a hydrogel solution. Uh, the hydrogel is usually a chromide. Um, you're putting that in with some paraformaldehyde that high, um, cross-links all the acrylamide monomers with your protein less than the sample. And then you add in a temperature-sensitive cross-linker, which when you heat up your sample, causes all that acrylamide to cross-link, and then you have your sample embedded in this, this nice gel. Um, it's just the protein that's cross-linked to that gel, the lipid in cross-link. So that means you can then dump in the detergent solution, and if you're brave, you're going to put an electric charge across the sample as well. And that's going to pull all of the lipid out of your sample. So your protein looks cross-linked to the hydrogel should stay behind. Okay. And then once you've done that, you can dump on a final clearing solution, and that's going to replace your intracellular and extracellular fluid, your lipid is all there, and it's going to try and match that protein with the um, here. So then the hydrogel embedding and hyperhydration is fairly similar. So again, you embed your tissue in, in acrylamide or acrylate hydrogel. Uh, but the difference here is once it's in that hydrogel, you totally denature or sometimes even enzymatically degrade um, all of the uh, protein and everything that's left behind there. 
Okay. So you usually do a labeling step before this, and then you get rid of all that protein. And then you put the sample um, into essentially water. It's going to expand that hydrogel um, and make the sample a lot bigger. And, and so, so now you've replaced that intracellular and extracellular fluid essentially with water. You've gotten rid of all that lipid. You've also gotten rid of most of that protein. Uh, it's either been degraded or just totally denatured. And you've also hyperhydrated that sample with a lot more water. So this comes out very close to the refractive index of water in the end, uh, which makes it really easy to image because a lot of our microscopes are designed for imaging things that are close to the refractive index of water. Um, but also your tissue is very, very fragile now because it's essentially just a gel. Um, and there's really nothing else left inside of there. And it's a lot bigger. Cool. So before I turn it over to Ted, I'll just give you a couple of quick examples of what this looks like in actual tissue. Um, these are both examples of the, the clarity process. So these are four totally different pieces of mouse skeletal muscle. Um, so this isn't like the size changing while you're going through this process. But this is what skeletal muscle looks like if you just cut it out of a mouse. This is what it looks like if you cut it out after you do a really good perfusion of that mouse. So this is one thing that's really important is you want to get as much blood as you possibly can out of the tissue during your perfusions because blood is just insanely autofluorescent and it'll just interfere with everything later on. You want to get as much of that out as you can. Um, this one down here has been perfused and then it's gone through the lipid extraction process. So it's gone through that SDF detergent step. So most of the lipid has been removed, but you can still see it's not clear. You still can't see all the lettering underneath here. And then this one has gone through the whole process, but has also been placed in that final refractive index matching solution, which is the final step that actually finally turns this clear. And now you can see the text really nicely. And this is just an image. This was a rainbow, rainbow mouse, so you can see the neuromuscular junction. That tissue. Okay, and that one was just done passively, so that was just setting it in those different solutions for a few days or a few weeks at a time. Um, we also have this system in the facilities. This is an active clarity system. It's called the X clarity system. Uh, this is essentially an electrophoresis chamber here that we can drop your sample into. It's going to cycle the um, clearing solution, that SDS solution, through the chamber as it removes all the lipids. And so if you take a brain, again, these are three different brains. The simple bulbs didn't magically reappear. Um, so what you're going to do is here's your brain after it's been embedded in the hydrogel. So it looks pretty much the same as it did when you started the process. This is after it comes out of that electrophoresis chamber. So you can see it's still very cloudy. It's not clear when it comes out of that step. But you can see it's, it's not like a solid cloudiness. It kind of looks a little more jelly-like. And it has expanded a bit, and this is totally normal. It will expand a bit while it's going through that process. Um, and then this is after it's sat in the final clearing solution for a couple days. The clearing solutions do still absorb a lot of blue light, so that's why this is looking yellowish. Um, it also does shrink back down a little bit. So again, these are three pieces of tissue, so don't think this expansion and contraction is totally accurate. But you will get some expansion at the step, and then it'll contract back down close to its original size um, once you go into that final, final turning solution. Okay. So this brain was a, a 5-1 GFP, and so this was finished on the light sheet. It took about three hours to take control of this, and then about a week and a half to put it all back together. Um, but you can see we can image through um, this has been downsampled a little bit, so it makes a movie with a label on my laptop. Uh, but if you just go somewhere inside this brain, I don't even know where it was, um, that's the type of resolution uh, that you get. So this was done off the light sheet microscope in our facility with the 5x objective. Um, so you can see you can still get a really good resolution with it, even if you're a Cool. All right, well, that's all I was going to say. Uh, we'll save questions till later. And uh, I'll let Ted take it from here. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, Ted, for coming out. Um, so today is the 
class if you want to learn besides this for the summer. Um, since it's August and everyone's going to be on vacation, uh, we'll, we'll take a break. And we'll probably start up again uh, October and November with a few more lunch um, and before before Christmas. Okay, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, great. So today we're going to continue with tissue clearing. So today is part two. We had part one two weeks ago. Um, so we talked a little about the different clearing techniques, how they work, and we talked about it. And what I want to do today is I want to move into how do we actually image these features, and then what do we do with what we did out of them. Right. So the second part about how to handle data, it's not going to be as specific to clear tissue. It's going to be more how do we do that. Um, just large amounts of data. Because obviously the clear tissue is not the only thing that's producing big data that's all the data out. There's all kinds of systems that are generating terabytes and terabytes of data. So just a really quick review of tissue clearing. Um, so the whole, for anyone who wasn't here two weeks ago, this is the whole idea behind tissue clearing is to take all of those different refractive indices, the different components of biological tissue that have different refractive indices, um, such as your intestinal fluid, the lipids, the proteins, you can see these all have slightly different uh, refractive indexes. What we want to do is either remove some of those components or adjust them so that everything has the exact same refractive index. And once we do that, we're going to end up with a nice clear tissue. So that's kind of just showing in the diagram down here. So this is this laser pointer shooting through these two plastic cubes. The one on the left here is just filled with water. So it's a nice homogeneous um, liquid. So there's only water in there, and our laser shoots straight through it. Nothing scatters or reflects it in the camera, which you're seeing up here. Uh, on the other hand, on this one, there's about 10 microliters of coffee cream in there. They look clear to the eyes. They look at the two. Um, but once we shine the laser through, we see all the laser lights scattering back and forth. So what we're trying to do with tissue clearing is get our tissue like this, nice and homogenous, with all the components having the same refractive index. Okay. So once we've got that, we've got our tissue, we've got it labeled, and now we've got to move to a microscope and take an image. So I introduced you to this image two weeks ago as well. And I think it's a little bit more appropriate today because we're actually talking about imaging. But what I said a couple weeks ago was, if you take a look at one of the inverted microscopes in our facility, they don't look all that different from this. Um, so obviously the objective is down underneath them are inverted. Um, but we still have that same sort of basic structure to a microscope that we had even uh, hundreds of years ago. And that's because we always, until recently, we were just dealing with very, very thin samples on slides. And that's how microscopes were designed, was always just to handle these thin slides. And now what happens is we actually have a lot of barriers with the design of the microscopes to be able to image these clear tissues where we now want to image a couple of millimeters um, in depth. So the microscopes just aren't designed for that. Okay. So in my opinion, um, there are five major barriers to imaging clear tissues with our standard microscopes that we have today. So the first one of these is the working distance of our objectives. Most of our really high resolution objectives, so the 63x, 100x, 1.4 numerical out aperture objectives, those are all meant for imaging less than 200 microns in the sample. That's the working distance. Once they've gone that far, they're going to hit the cover slip and you're not going to be able to go with it. Even our really low resolution objectives, um, like say, a point or lower, let's say, like a 20x air objective, um, those might only do half a millimeter. Okay? So there's definitely a big restriction here in the working distance of our objectives, how far they're designed to image into the sample. The other problem is these op, um, objectives are usually not to a specific refractive index. Um, and that does not often equate to the clearing solutions that we're using for these samples. So they have some different refractive indices that typically <coughs> match a lot well to what our objectives up until now have been designed for. 
third problem is some of these techniques use some solvents that can be quite damaging to a microscope. So specifically plastic components, they'll dissolve those pretty quickly if they come in contact with them. Or they can also dissolve the glue, the gold glue lenses that you expect to be placed. So if you take a dipping objective, like you usually put into water or PDS, and you put that into one of these solvents, you can start to dissolve that glue and eventually you'll put a minus minute quality of the objection. Uh, and then the last two are the amount of time that it's going to take to image this. So obviously if you increase your volume by many orders of magnitude, you're also increasing the amount of time that it's going to take to by a similar uh, amount. And now we're ending up with all kinds of data, so we've got to figure out some way to <coughs> that um, and what to do with it. Okay? So these are what I find to be the five major barriers to imaging clear tissue. So let's take a look at the, the first three here. How do we get around these first three? The objective working distance, the refractive index, is match, and the The first thing you need to know is that there are some microscopes that just aren't going to be able to do this. Okay, so for example, an inverted microscope here, our objectives sit under the stage, and they move up and down. They usually have a fairly limited travel distance. Um, so, an inverted microscope is not a good solution for imaging clear tissue. Often you just can't move the um, objectives far enough to cover the, all the, the entire distance through your sample. Okay. So, um, in these situations, an upright microscope is definitely much preferred. Uh, the turrets on these, in general, have a much larger um, travel distance. But you have to be careful because there's obviously different versions of upright microscopes as well. Um, so this is an Axio camera. This is what our upright scopes in the lab are. We have a very large travel distance on this objective chain. Zeiss also makes a, an Axio integer, which is also an upright microscope. And I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure the travel distance is a lot shorter than that. Um, so this is one of the first things you got to do. The next thing is we're now lucky enough that because tissue clearing has been around for a while, there's now a wide array of objectives available for imaging in these weird solutions. And so what they, um, they all have in common is fairly low magnifications. So this means you can image a fairly large area, which is great. Um, they're very high resolution objectives. They all have numerical apertures above 0.9. Most importantly, they have really long working distances. So we can go greater than five millimeters um, into a tissue to achieve these objectives. Uh, they're all dipping objectives, uh, which means you don't have to worry about a cover slip or some kind of chamber to keep your sample in. Um, and they're refractive index match to the clearing solution. The one thing you do have to be careful with is not all of these are compatible with the solvent clearing based methods. Um, specifically, this is the, the Zeiss objective that we have up in the facility. Don't ever dip this thing into solvent, okay? It's not, it's not meant for that. Um, some of the other ones are, are compatible with that, but not the ones we have up here. Cool. So, um, one of the, some of the common mistakes that, that I've seen people make in the past uh, especially people that don't have access to one of those special clearing objectives, is to look around at what they have in the lab and give that a try. So, and if you look at some of the original papers too that came out of the clearing field, a lot of times they made similar mistakes to this as well. Uh, so one of the first things people do is they just reach for a water dipping objective. Um, so here, once again, we have a fairly large field of view, which is great. We've got a high numerical aperture, so we get a really good resolution. Fairly long working distance, two and a half millimeters. Um, it's a dipping objective as well. But the big problem here is that this objective is calibrated for dipping into water for a refractive index of 1.33. So, what does that mean? Um, so, here's a little simple experiment. This is just a petri dish that's filled with water. Uh, I put some fluorescent beads along the bottom of it and just covered them with a little pad of agros just to let they stay in place there. And then I took some Z-stacks through these beads. Okay. And so 
This is when this dish is filled with water. Okay, so here's our uh, XY image of D, and here's our XZ projection of the D. So our Z resolution is always worse than the light microscope. Uh, so this actually looks pretty good. Now, if we do that exact same experiment, so that's again with this objective, but instead of water or PBS in here, we put in a uh, proto solution. You can now see that this is looking a little distorted. It's really bright in the middle, but it's getting dimmer on the outside. This is, these images are like averages of like uh, or three feet on top of each other. But the big problem you see is in the Z dimension, you get this really large stretching of that point spread function. Really ugly um, when you actually start to do some 3D images. But if we switch our objective back to this one, let's actually design to work in this proto solution. You now see we go back to a nice tighter point spread function, both in the lateral and axial. Okay. So that's why you don't want to do this when you want to do it. So the other thing that people often reach for is an error objective. Um, obviously, we're again low magnification, so we're in our big field of view. Uh, this one in particular, this is what we have on most of our systems upstairs. It's actually a really high resolution for a 10x objective, so a 0.45 meter cloud here. It's going to be a pretty decent image. Uh, it's got a pretty long working distance as well, but it's two millimeters. Um, so this is a, an error objective, so obviously you're not going to dip it into your sample, so you might have some more consideration on the sample prep, sample prep side. Um, but the big issue here, and I'll try and walk you through this ridiculous diagram, um, but the big thing that we have to deal with now is that the light coming out of this objective is passing through air, and then it's going to go into our clearing solution, which has a higher refractive index. So there's going to be a refraction that uh, light's going to bend. So let's take a look at the objective here in position number one. So you're imaging right at the top of your sample. If this wasn't an air objective, and this was, um, let's say we had some immersion oil here, which has about the same refractive index as this clearing solution, uh, <coughs> our light from this objective would be focused right along these black lines. So it would just go straight. There wouldn't be any refraction at the surface because there's no refractive index in this map. Okay. But because we have an air objective, what actually happens is our light comes down, it bends, and then it lands right down here. So this is where we would expect our first imaging plane to be, and here's where it actually is. That isn't a big deal when you're looking at that first imaging plane. But now what happens is if we move our objective this distance, so the distance of this red arrow, uh, so we're doing a z-stack through our sample, we think that we have moved this deep in our sample as well. But what's actually happened is when you trace this out, um, so if we go back to pretending we had oil here, we have our black lines that just go straight from no refraction, you can see that the distance that our actual focal plane had moved, if we didn't have a refractive index mismatch, is this green arrow, it's exactly the same size as the red arrow. But because we don't have oil here, we have air, we have that refraction, here's where our focal plane actually ends up. So what that means is we've only moved our objective this far, the microscope software thinks we've only moved that far, but our focal plane inside the sample has actually moved the distance of this orange arrow. So that means we've actually moved twice as far in the sample as we've moved our objective. Right. Here's the big problem with that. If you do a z-stack through that sample, uh, so this is just a spheroid, which we should know should be quite spherical. That's called a spheroid. But it actually looks pretty flat here. Okay, so this is the XZ projection and the YZ projection, um, and this is just an XY plane. And you can see it looks kind of squished, it's not round at all. It's like an oval. And that's because the microscope only thinks it's moved this far, and it's taken this much data and squished it flat into this distance. Right. So we can actually apply a correction to that data, and if we apply the proper correction, 
Um, now it stretches that data back out, and you can see we actually have a sphere there and not uh, a switch. Okay. Um, so that's one of the big things to watch out for when you're imaging with an air objective. And it's very obvious in this situation. Um, I think these guys are about 500 microns, maybe a little bit more in size. But even if you're working with like a thin um, tissue section, I often get this question a lot of times. People will do a Z-stack through it and they'll say, I cut my sections at such and such thickness. Why is it not that same thickness on the microscope? If you're imaging with an air objective, this might be one of the major reasons for that. So that's um, the first three issues kind of that we're taking care of. So don't use water dipping objectives. Make sure you're using one of our clearing specific objectives. Or if you're using an air objective, make sure you're applying the correction. And you can do that in the play software or I have a CD macro that like you do that for the time as well. Um, okay, so now the next problem, imaging time. So I think I showed you, no, I didn't show you this uh, slide a couple weeks ago. So I did this calculation that if you wanted to image an entire mouse brain with one of our laser scanning confocals or, or two photon microscope, and you wanted to use a 20x objective, you're doing a one micron Z step, which is actually undersampling a little bit. You wanted to do this at one frame per second, which might give you a little noise, but it won't be too bad. You're just doing one color imaging. Uh, you actually need 4.2 million images to cover that whole brain, and that would take about 50 days to do. Okay? Um, so that's not really an option. <laughs> um, so, one of the ways around this might be to go to a lower magnification objective. Um, objective magnification and numerical aperture usually go hand in hand. So if you go to a lower magnification, you also get a lower numerical aperture. So here's an example of a 1.0 numerical aperture objective, uh, which is what our 20Xs usually are um, on the, the, the clarity clearing objective. And then here's an objective with numerical aperture of 0.16. So this is around what the 5X air objective usually is. So if you ignore the green stripe for now and just look at the red stripe, this is um, a representation of the focal point of those two objectives, okay? So the high numerical aperture objective, and this is in the Z connection, we get a really nice, tight um, point spread function here, okay? On the other side, when you go to this low numerical aperture, you can see we have this massive PSF that I've actually cut off the top and bottom of it just because it was so big. Uh, there's no point in showing it all. So if you go, to a 5x objective on a confocal, yes, you get a nice big field of view, but you get an absolutely terrible field resolution. And the confocal actually is going to make this a little bit better, but it can't make it anywhere near this unless you have the numerical aperture for it. All right? So this is the reason you don't want to go down to a 5x objective on a confocal for imaging clear tissue. It's just going to be an absolute mess in the C dimension. All right? But we switch to a totally different microscope, so if we take a look at our light sheet microscope, we can now get around this issue. So in the light sheet microscope, instead of sending our excitation light in through the same objective that we collect our fluorescence in, we use this perpendicular arrangement of the objectives. So we have objectives here on the side that project in our excitation light, the blue light here, and we have an objective in the back that collects our light. Okay. Now this one here shows uh, a 20x dipping objective. This can also be a 5x air objective. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to move our sample back and forth through this um, thin sheet of light. And we're going to capture each of our z points that way. So if we go back to this diagram, uh, now you can pay attention to the green sheet across here. And this is representing our arrangement of our objectives, okay, in that light sheet. So here's the objective up top that's collecting our light, and here's the objective in the side that's projecting in our light sheet. So 
this green area here represents the excitation light that's coming in. And so what this means is that only molecules that are contained within this area of the light sheet are going to be getting excited. Okay? So over here it's not going to make much of a difference because our point spread function is still smaller um, than the width of that light sheet. But over in this situation where we have that low numerical aperture objective, what this means is we essentially cut off our point spread function here and here. Okay? Because our overall point spread function of the system is um, a convolution of these two point spread functions. So what that means is we've taken that point spread function that comes out of this objective. Again, this is still chopped off on the top and bottom. It keeps going. And we've now made this new objective point spread function by only exciting fluorophores in this region of our light sheet. So this now means that we get an image with this low magnification. And our resolution in Z is going to be much higher than the So on the light sheet, we can get away with these low So now, if we take that same sample and go to the light sheet, we can use a 5x magnification. We can do a 5 micron D step. We can image a lot faster because we don't have to wait for our laser to scan back and forth all the way across our sample. We just position our sample, take an image, move our sample, take another image. So now we only need about 28,000 image planes to do this, and it takes about two or three hours instead of 20 days. So, much more advantageous, easier, better. Cool. So um, this is the way we do it if we have an entire mesh frame. Uh, so with that 5x objective, we get a field of view of about 2 millimeters squared. And so that requires about 40 tile tiles to cover an entire mesh frame. Um, there is still a working distance limitation even with that 5x objective. We can usually get uh, between 4 to 5.5 millimeters, depending on how it was mounted, deep into the tissue. That's not quite enough to go all the way through, so if you do want the entire brain, you have to image it from one side, do 180 degree rotation, image it from the other side, and then use some software later to put those back together again. Right? So, but still, even doing it that way, it takes about 3 hours hours to image. Um, unless you're doing like a lot of colors, you're doing four color images. And this is the image that I showed you a couple weeks ago, and this is what you get in the end. Um, this is down sampled a little so that it can make a nice movement and play on my laptop. But if you go somewhere inside that brain, I don't know where this actually is from, uh, this is the resolution that you're getting, and this is with that 5x objective on the light sheet. So you're still getting a lot of detail. This is a by one view of large. So that's how we image this tissue. Um, what I want to talk to you about for the second half is what do we do with all the data. And so um, like I said, this isn't just a light sheet program problem or just um, uh, clear tissue imaging problem. Uh, a lot of you are doing a lot of imaging on the axia scan. You can see this can spit out a lot of data really quick. If you're doing four color brain slices, you end up with about four gigs per slice. You put eight slices on a slide, there's 32 gigs, you do 40 slices on slides, you're already over a terabyte of data. Um, the Shear and the Anchor Labs like to do these days of deeper fish at night. Um, these end up being about one gigabyte per fish that they array out these um, plates. If you do 300 fish, there's 300 gigabytes. Um, if you're doing developmental imaging on the light sheet, so you might be doing fairly small but light sheet standard Z slices of just 300 Z slices. But if you're doing this on three different angles, two different colors. Um, you can see this quickly adds up as well to be many terabytes of data when you have a number of hours or days. And now our, with our self-discoverer, where we're able to 
take the multi-wall plate, so I think this is a 384 wall plate, you can even go higher than that. You can stack about 20 of them in the robot and load them one at a time. Uh, this, I don't even know what that number that gets to. Uh, thankfully, I don't have to fight that yet. Um, but uh, the four color imaging on a high res camera, I don't even want to know what that number is. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to get to this big data problem. Um, but if we go back to this guy that I showed you before, um, if anyone ever actually did do this and we did have one person do it, uh, well, I won't name names, uh, <laughs> but he actually did do a 30 terabyte data set. Uh, in the end, I don't think it was, it was more just uh, I gave him a medal for doing it, but I don't think we ever did much more data. <laughs> so, if, uh, if we do go back to the slide back subjective, um, we're doing 40 tiles, two colors. Uh, this ends up being about a terabyte per frame. Uh, usually somewhere between half and a terabyte, depending on what they've got one color or two color. So what do we do with that? Well, actually, when we started out, this was a total disaster. Um, the original light sheet system that we had came with one computer. I think it had about 10 terabytes of storage on it, which when it showed up, this was five years ago, so that seemed massive. Um, it was connected by this really fast connection. But we filled this thing up in a matter of days. Um, and then I don't even know how many of these like USB 3 hard drives we had that were just scattered around people's labs um, all over the place. And this was the way we were doing it at first. So this was not sustainable at all. Um, so you're all lucky enough that we've now made a number of upgrades so uh, pretty much all of the acquisition computers on the microscopes in the facility are all connected into this really high speed optical fiber network. And they can send data to the workstations inside my office. They can also send data straight to our HDBI server, which right now is about 300 terabytes. It's going up to 400 terabytes, hopefully this week, if not already. Um, and then, of course, the workstations can send data there as well. This is linked into the Harvard Odyssey cluster, so you can do processing on Odyssey by just transferring your data back and forth this way. And then most of you all have a fair, large um, shared space for your lab as well, somewhere on the RC network. So I don't even know how much storage space there is there in addition to do all of this. Um, but thankfully, we're at a point now where we can move the data around short to medium term. Um, <coughs> certainly none of this is, is permanent as far as Cool. So how do we actually deal <coughs> with these big files? Um, so what's kind of going on behind the scenes in, in the software that we're using? So uh, traditional TIFF files are in a 32-bit format. What that means is that there's a limit on how many pixels a TIFF file can store. So something like this, a single plane from um, our mouse frame at about half a gigabyte, no problem. We can store that in a standard TIFF file. But these standard TIFF files, that pixel limit usually kicks in somewhere between two and four gigabit, or gigabytes. Um, and so this is a hard limit on a standard TIFF file. So an image like this off the Axios scan with four gigabytes in size cannot be stored in a normal TIFF format. So you have to do something to that data if you want to store it in a TIFF file, some sort of downsampling or compression um, to, to get it stored into a traditional 32-bit format. So there's um, a couple things, uh, a couple techniques that are used in the software field for big data. I am by no means a computer scientist, so this is going to be hopefully a very easy and probably oversimplified explanation of what goes on. Um, but there's a couple techniques that we use for visualizing this data, and I'm going to talk about these. Uh, and then there's also a couple of other options that we have for speeding up quantitation if you're trying to do some analysis on it. So the first thing to know is that where you're storing your data really matters. 
So if you've got a big 3D data set that you want to display on the computer in three dimensions and render it and interact with it, that somehow has to get onto your graphics card. Okay? But it's obviously not stored on your graphics card or your CPU, it's stored in memory somewhere. So if you have that image in the RAM on your computer in the memory, this is a really fast transfer rate back and forth here. So you can render that and interact with it quite quickly and easily. The next fastest option is to have that on an SSD drive. Um, but you can see this is quite a bit slower in the transfer rates here. And so if you're trying to render that directly from an SSD drive, you might run into some lags and some slowness. Um, if you're using a standard spindle drive, it gets even slower. And then if you've got this part somewhere on a storage server over the network, it's even worse. Okay? Now, over here I've listed some limitations to the size of the data that can arise in these. Now, these aren't hard limits. These take into consideration things like expense or cost as well. Um, so we've got some workstations upstairs that have 200 gigs of RAM in them, or almost 200 gigs. Uh, this used to be a hard limit in Windows 7, but not in Windows 10 anymore. Um, but this is pretty expensive, uh, especially thanks to all the Bitcoin mining people out there. It's getting even worse. Um, but it's not cheap to buy this much RAM. Uh, same thing with SSD drives. Um, this is they're actually probably even a little bit bigger now. Um, but just to buy one of these with this size is a huge cost. You can put them into a RAID array, but it is really, really expensive if you want to expand that in a larger than that. Um, hard drives, these are actually getting fairly cheap now. We can put those in a RAID array and make really, really big storage on a workstation, like some of our stuff there, some 30 terabytes on them. Uh, and then when you go to a network storage server, you, you get really, really big. Um, so what happens when your image is too big for RAM? Because obviously the ideal thing is just to have that entire image in RAM, you can quickly access it to your GPU. Um, or your CPU if you can process on it. But what happens if we've got this one terabyte file with 1800 of these slices in size? Obviously that doesn't fit into our 100 gigabytes of RAM. So one of the options is to downsample your data. Okay? So you can see this image here. Um, is only 12 gigabytes, and that's because I did a 4x4 four four downsampling on it. So what that means is that for every 4x4 um, four four square pixel, so we're going to use 16 pixels in the original image, I just said what's the mean intensity of those 16 pixels, and replace them with one pixel of that intensity. Okay? So when you're looking on this scale, it looks totally fine, no big deal. Um, and this image is now only 6% of what the original uh, size was of about 200 gigs. But there is a trade-off when you do this. So if we take a look at this beautiful rainbow image here, if we downsample this four times, now what you can see is the nice smooth edges of these cell bodies actually become all chunky and pixelated. And the individual fibers that you're able to see up above here just sort of blend into one another and they're a lot more difficult to see. So whenever you do sort of downsampling like that, you're obviously giving up a lot of resolution, which might not be something that you want to do. So another option is compression. So we can take that TIFF file and convert it into a JPEG. JPEG's kind of the most common compression that we're all used to because that's what happens with all the images we take on our camera phones. Um, but you can see just from this image already, you can see there's a loss in quality there. Uh, if we blow it up, it becomes a little more obvious, but we lose these sharp transitions between the green and red lines, and we're losing some intensity there as well. Right? So that JPEG compression is uh, reducing the quality of your image to some extent as well. Um, this is the kind of standard JPEG compression. JPEG 2000, which is a newer version of it, is a little bit better. You don't lose quite as much um, when you go down the street. Okay, so another option is to use something called a virtual stack. So what we're going to do here is we have this big file, but we're only going to take one Z slice at a time and put it into RAM and visualize that. So 
So this is no problem um, to visualize. We, we have a very small amount of data in our RAM, but it's really slow when you want to move from slide to slide. There's a lot of time for it to go back to this file, pull out one slice, put it here, and then send it this way. So there's a big delay when you're trying to move from here. That's not a good idea either. What is most commonly done now is a combination of pyramids and um, tiling and blocking. So what we do here is an image pyramid. This is Google Earth kind of being just famous. Um, is you take your original image and then you produce um, a downsampled version of that, another one, and another one, and another one. And so what you can do is if you're looking at it at a very zoomed out portion, you just load in a more resolution image. As you zoom in closer and closer to your sample, you load higher and higher resolution images, but because you're only looking at a smaller field of view at that point, as you zoom in, you only load that small area. Um, this allows you to load things much quicker because you're only loading a small area, but still get that high resolution. Or you can back off all the way out and see the whole sample, but just have a lower resolution and it's still not taxing your system. The only drawback to this is that it increases your file size by about 20%, because instead of just storing this image, you're now also storing all these other images. The other thing we can do is we can take that whole 3D volume and then chunk it into smaller pieces. Okay, so we can take this big cube and break it down into these eight smaller cubes. And then once again, depending on what you actually want to visualize or look at, the computer knows to just load, say, that one chunk into RAM, okay? We can combine both of these ideas together, and we can make an image pyramid for each one of these chunks. And now, instead of loading uh, one gigabyte file, maybe you're only loading a 15 megabyte low resolution pyramid Okay. And this is a really simplified explanation of what's called the HDF5 file structure. Uh, and this is an open source file structure, but even all of the closed source ones really run something similar to, to this type of format. Right. Great. So that's kind of what's often going on in the background. So what do we have as far as software to actually take advantage of these techniques? Um, in the past, I always used to say, you can do anything with VG, it's just going to take a little bit longer and maybe be a little less user friendly than some of the flash and commercial software. Um, and that still holds true. Um, you can convert a file to HDF5 and VG and visualize it that way using the big data here. Um, but it, it is tough. VG in our image J in its standard form wants to load everything into RAM. And if you want to do any quantitation or um, get some numbers out of your data, most of those processes require everything to end up in RAM. So unfortunately, with a lot of these really big data sets, PG MSJ isn't um, as useful as it used to be, unless you want to do this on the cluster, and you can run an instance with uh, a huge amount of RAM. So we're primarily using um, two programs, uh, the size of Zen software and this Vision 4D um, from Arivas for doing these really large type of data sets. So by really large, I mean stuff that's like hundreds of gigabytes in size. Uh, so Zen's advantageous for looking at 2D data. Um, so it's really good for Axio scan data and cell discovery data. It doesn't use RAM with your image, so if you have a 100 gigabyte image off the active scan, you can open that on your laptop with 8 gigs of RAM um, in that light, just as well as you can open it in one of our workstations with 200 gigs of RAM. Um, so it does use image pyramids, so your file sizes do increase by 20%. Uh, that's just done automatically behind the scenes. You never see it, you just see your file size and you can that there. Um, files off the Axios scan will also automatically use this JPEG XR compression. So they're made a lot smaller, which is really nice because it means I don't have to empty out the hard drive every day on that system. Um, 
but it's also a little tougher because there aren't a lot of other programs that will visualize or open JSON <coughs> files. Uh, so oftentimes you have to go through some um, file conversions and things like that in the background. That can be a little bit uh, Vision 4D from Arevis. Uh, this is really great for 3D um, or even 4D data sets if you're doing time as well. Uh, it's been tested with data sets, I think, up over 10 terabytes. Of, um, so it's definitely the, the leader in the field for dealing with these large data sets. Uh, it's our basically exclusive solution for stitching back together with light chain data sets when you've done multiple fields of view to image your entire brain. It also doesn't use RAM, and there's some sort of magic sauce in the program that they won't tell me about. Uh, but you don't increase your file size, so there isn't that extra 20% for a pyramid. But you can read files that are on your hard drive almost as though they were in RAM. Um, it's really excellent at determining how much, how many resources you have in your RAM and on your memory, on your video card, and just loading as much as it can, but downsampling it so that it fits there and you can interact with it really nicely. Okay. So those are the options that we have as far as visualization uh, up in the facility. Um, just a, a couple points on quantitation. So quantitation is totally separate from visualization. So we're at a point now where visualizing the data isn't much of a problem. It takes a little while to get to that point where you have everything reassembled and, and rendered into a three-dimensional image. But there's no hiccups along the way. Um, quantitation is still something that I'd say is really challenging and still somewhat, there isn't a super easy solution for it, but we are seeing um, sort of lights at the end of the tunnel or better ways to get there. So this is a screenshot of the task manager off my old laptop, it was a dual core processor. Um, so it's two cores, each of those can hyper thread, so you can have three threads running at the same time. Pretty much every software now that we use is all multi-threaded. So it can take advantage of these multiple cores. So one of the things that's great is some of our workstations up there will have these uh, processors where there's two processors in the computer and they have like 14 cores each. So this means along with hyper-threading, you can actually have 56 of these processes going at the same time. So that can dramatically speed things up. Another thing that's really helpful is some of our processing is now starting to move to the graphics cards. These graphics cards can really speed up parallel processing. So you can see this particular card that's coming on our new workstation has 3,800 cores on it. Um, so you can really do some data processing very fast. And this is what we're using for our deconvolution now, um, which really speeds things up. And then, of course, the other option, we're fortunate enough to be right next to the Odyssey cluster computer here. Uh, so this is actually uh, a couple years old, so I think it's actually much larger than this at this point. Um, but a lot of our open source programs uh, are able to be run on the cluster, um, which allows you to really handle these large data sets. It still takes time, not as fast, um, but it's And then the one last thing that uh, I'm excited about that I think is going to be um, hopefully here sooner than later is this idea of doing analysis while you're still imaging. So one of the things that's um, it's in place now, we don't have it installed yet, but it's possible. So when you're using that Arebus 4D vision software, you have to take your CZI file off the light sheet and convert it to the Arebus file type, which is an SIS file. Um, there's a little program now that can run in the background, and as soon as you've done a time point or as soon as you've done a tile, uh, that little program sees that file sitting there, and it immediately converts it to the SIS format. Right? So by the time that you're done acquiring your image, you've already got your file converted um, into the SIS format. Right? That's one example. Another example is Zen Black you now does this as well for Airy scan data. Um, so you can, if you're doing an area scan acquisition, 
working with multiple time points. Um, if you send that data to one of the workstations inside my office, you can start uh, doing the array scan processing as each time point arrives, as opposed to having to do it after you've acquired it. But unfortunately, <laughs> when you're dealing with this much data, the thing you have to remember is it's not going to be fast. So the days of acquiring data for an hour and doing a half hour of processing it doesn't happen anymore. It's not possible. Um, when you're trying to chug through a terabyte data set, it doesn't matter how many cores you have, it's going to take a really long time to do it. Um, the worst part about it is because a lot of what we do in image analysis is iterative, where we'll try something that doesn't work out, we've got to redo that segmentation. Sometimes you let something run overnight, didn't work, change some variables, have to let it run overnight again. Change some variables, have to let it run overnight again. Um, the only way to get around this is to just try and pull out some representative, representative with the small areas of your data. Work on that first, and get something that's working well there, and then apply that to the big data set. Um, but it definitely can be key. <coughs> I know that image that I showed you at that 51 GFP mouse brain, it took three hours to acquire that data. It took me two weeks to get that movie afterwards. Um, so it's definitely not So cool, that's all I have for today. Um, thanks again for coming out. I think the summer lunch and learns were really successful from our end to make such great attendance. And uh, hopefully from the fall we'll be able to start it up again. And uh, if anyone has any ideas or any things that they'd like to know more about, um, feel free to send me an email and, and we'll try to put that in. Usually what we do is we sort of pick stuff that we don't know enough about or aren't too sure about so that we learn it a little bit better by teaching it to you. Uh, but if there's anything you really want to know, please, please let us know. Okay. And we'll see you in a couple months.